Sometimes, the closer you are to your food source, the better it tastes. And what better place to find excellent seafood than an island in the pristine Andaman Sea? These guys are harvesting sea cicadas, also known as mole crabs. They don't have pincers and are only about an inch big. In Phuket, sea cicadas are only found in the soft sand by water's edge on a few beaches. Local harvesters just kick up the sand with their feet, pull the nets through the water, and let the tide carry the cicadas into the nets. Sea cicadas are more like a tiny crab than the traditionally known cicada insects. And there's a restaurant that prepares and cooks them right along the shore. Jaka John Seafood is a family-run business that's been parked in front of this sea cicada hotspot for about 30 years. Go figure, sea cicadas are their top dish. They're washed thoroughly to remove all the excess sand and the tiny legs are removed. There are two popular cooking methods. One, simply tossed in cornstarch and fried with fresh garlic. Oh my gosh. If you love soft shell crabs, if you love delicious teeny little shrimp that you eat whole skin on, you will love these. Oh, wow. But they also fry them tempura style. This is like the popcorn shrimp of the Phuket beach scene. I could eat about 700 of these. Tiny crabs often get overlooked, but gathering them right in front of the restaurant that serves them, now that's worth stopping to check out. You know the old saying, when in Rome? Well, when in Iceland, you do as the Vikings do, which means you head towards the sea where Icelanders eat a vile and revolting dish known as hakarl. Simply put, it's rotten shark. I'm told eating it without gagging separates the men from the boys. The largest farm where Hakarl is produced is located an intentional three hours from Reykjavik. Producers aren't allowed anywhere near civilization because the smell is so foul. People are known to get violently sick just from the stench. Take a look at the Hildebrander farm. Talk about picturesque, but the beauty takes a back seat to the overriding agitation to your olfactory senses. I know in an instant where the putrefied shark is kept, an old wooden hut up the road. Hakarl is made from the Greenlandic shark, which is one of the few sharks able to live in the cold Atlantic waters here. They say the meat is poisonous when fresh because of the shark's high level of uremic acid. Those who attempt to eat the meat too soon have been known to vomit blood. Iceland's ancestors spent years trying to figure out how to treat the meat so that it can be eaten. Their solution? Let it rot. Gudjun Hildebrander runs the family Hakarl business. So the fish comes out of the water and it comes to you. Yeah. <laughs> you don't just keep it here on the... No, we don't keep it here. <laughs> uh, well, we just caught it, similar yeah. like normal fish, and we caught it in five or 10 kilos pieces uh -huh. and put it in special wooden boxes for fermentation for six to eight weeks. Wow, and then what happens? Then we hang the pieces up for, for drying. Can we see it in the boxes? Uh, no, I'm sorry, you can't. Uh, <laughs> Why yeah. not? Well, that has to be a secret. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Can we see it in the drying yeah, room? We, yeah, we can take a oh, look okay. at that. Oh, okay. All right. Holy moly. This is incredible. My God. Hanging from the rafters are 60 sharks, all cut up in pieces like they were ham shanks. Each chunk that you see here is three times smaller than its original size. The meat naturally shrinks during the fermentation process, making it easier for Gujan to cut and hang each slab. They'll hang here for at least two to three months before eating. The skin looks like it would just rip you open if you touched it. It's so sharp. Yeah, it's very sharp. And in the old days, they, could, they used it like for sandpaper. They tried to use everything in the back then. I have to admit, Hakaro looks edible, but there's something about unrefrigerated meat hanging on hooks unprotected from the elements that makes me a little wary. It smells like something died. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna bring you a very good piece. I like my medium rare and okay. not too oily. Okay, that's no problem. It's very accommodating, these Icelanders. We have a very, very good one here. Oh yeah, I was eyeing that piece before. Wow, beautiful piece. 
Now, this Dunny, do you, do you need me to grab a piece of fence to put it on? No, that's okay. Yeah, you're all right? Yeah, I'm just... You're just gonna nail it up or something? Yeah, maybe we'll just put it up here. Oh, yeah, there you go. And, uh... Ooh. See. Nice one. And... Smell it. Oh, my gosh. It doesn't... It smells like ammonia. Yeah. Do you want one? Sure. The smell is a little intimidating. Yeah? Okay. How is it? Tastes much better than it smells. That smell reminds me of some of the most horrific things I've ever breathed in my life. But the taste of it is sweet, it's nutty, and it's only faintly fishy. I'll take another piece. Another one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no yeah. problem. It's very healthy. This is very good for your stomach. Oh. A lot of people eat it, like, for their, for their health. Psychologically, you're predisposed not to want to eat it. It just seems more dangerous now, but I, I trust you. You're the expert's expert. Oh, that's hardcore. That's serious food. You don't want to mess with that. That's not for beginners. <laughs> oh my gosh. If rotted shark meat is an Icelandic initiation, I think I've passed the test. Now that we're back on the road, it's time to think about breakfast. The Kalia, that pile of mystery meat, has been sitting in the hot van since yesterday, so I'm sure it's nice and ripe. Mo knows of a beautiful kasba where we can stop and eat. Beautiful. These castles or garrisons are found throughout southern Morocco and were originally built to house tribal leaders and protect the Berber tribes from outside invaders. I'm standing here at the entryway to the oasis in front of the ancient Kasbah at Ait Ben Hadou, the old fortress that has served as the background for many of Hollywood's most famous movies. In fact, the film Gladiator was shot right here, and whenever I'm in Ait Ben Hadou, all the locals refer to me by my Gladiator nickname, Stomachus Maximus. As well they should, judging by what I have planned for breakfast. Here you go. Kalia, mixed with eggs, is a popular breakfast dish here in Morocco. The mystery meat, what kind is anyone's guess, is salted, dried, and then preserved in its own fat. That's the yellow mushy stuff you see surrounding the meat. Putrid meat with eggs. I love it. I get myself prepared. Beautiful view lots of sunshine, and a plate of who knows what. The putrid and foul stench that accompanies the rotten, spoiled meat that we've mixed in here with our eggs this morning is doing two things simultaneously that I always thought were mutually exclusive. It's both scaring the pants off of me and attracting every fly within 500 kilometers of Eight Ben Hadou. Little egg, a little bit of whatever this is. It's a mini breakfast burrito. Oh my gosh, that is really strong. The smell through my nose is of rotted meat. There is no amount of visiting some of the most hellacious and foul smelling places on earth, and trust me, I've been there, uh, that matches up with getting your face up close and personal with a little chalia for breakfast. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Oh my God. Thank God there's some kind of chicken egg in there to sort of soften the blow. Oh my Lord. If you really want to understand the culture of a country, you try everything, you eat everything, and I just defer to the people that enjoy this dish, and I defend their right to eat kalia every single morning of their lives if they like. For me, it's definitely an acquired taste. But you gotta give me some points. I tried it twice. <laughs> Uh, 
The state of Alaska is arguably the least connected of any of the United States. Aside from Anchorage and Fairbanks, many cities and villages are accessible only by sea or air for much of the year. The small fishing village of Bethel, Alaska is one of those landlocked towns. Located on the western side of the state, Bethel is a lifeline for the dozens of tiny villages that dot the Kuskokwim River. The river and surrounding wilderness provide a way of life for many families here, most of whom are Yupik Eskimos. Sourcing food here in the winter is a challenge, to say the least. I'm meeting a local Yupik, Anna David, who's going to show me the ropes. Something tells me you have to be Anna. Yes. Look, uh, Andrew. Uh, mm. First stop, Yvonne Waska's home. He's on his way to check his whitefish nets, and he may have a few oh, nice fish for us. You. I'm honored to be here. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, how do we get to the fishing grounds? By snowmobile? Yes. Perfect. All righty. You ready back there? I'm ready. All right, hang on. Now this is cool. Yvonne's nets are actually under the ice, placed carefully early in the winter before the ice gets too thick. His method of fishing is common in the Bethel area, and it's pretty labor intensive. Now the Jewish kid from New York always has to unwind the rope. Yvonne begins by chipping through the ice with a handmade ice pick. No power tools required here. Yvonne is a man of few words, but much wisdom. Because of the thickness of the ice, the nets are actually down about 10 feet under the surface. <laughs> Ooh, that's a white fish. You're darn tootin' it is. Overall, it's a productive morning as we pull about 20 whitefish up. All right, hey Yvonne, we only have one small problem now. I can't feel any of my hands. <laughs> No need for additional refrigeration. We take a few fish and head to our next destination. Ta-da! I hope I didn't goof up the nets too much. You should cut more fish. <laughs> <laughs> next time. Next time when I come up. Thank you very, very much. Hop on, sister. Yvonne has other fish to fry, so I'm going with Anna to her good friend Lucy Crow's house for a little lunch. I'd like you to meet Lucy Crow. Hi. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having us in your home. Lucy is preparing a variety of traditional native dishes. When she and Anna were growing up, there was no electricity, no refrigeration, baking was unheard of. Everything they ate was either fresh, dried, or smoked. Today, we're eating something called stinkheads, boiled blackfish, seal soup, once again, a gutuk or Eskimo ice cream. But first up, the blackfish, topped off with seal oil. Mm, sounds tame enough. Here I am. Here you. <laughs> All right, so what do you do? You took the head. You eat the head. Push it against the roof of your mouth and your teeth and just kind of get all the goodness out. <laughs> oh. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Suck all the goodies out mm -hmm. of it. Oh, all that brain and head fat's pretty darn tasty. But the meat that's on these mm -hmm. little bones mm -hmm. is incredible. Now, seal oil is not readily available at your local store, so Lucy got hers and the seal for the soup from her sister who lives in a remote coastal village to the north. Mm -hmm. All right. Seal soup, here goes nothing. Isn't that good? Wow. Yeah, it's much fishier than I thought it would be. But the meat itself 
tender. Is really tender and kind of beefy. Mm -hmm. Look at you just tear into the stinky stuff. That unrecognizable stinky stuff can be summed up in one word, stinkheads. These are actually fish heads that have been buried and left to rot, then dug up and eaten weeks later. And this is safe to eat, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Oh. <laughs> Those smell ripe. Are you it's into these like, also? It's just like uh, eating aged cheese. That's, that is very true. You don't like it? Um, it is, it's, you've got to get past that, uh, that taste on the back of the mouth and just... There's nothing wrong with the flavor of those mm -hmm. or the texture. It's just that where I come from, mm -hmm. in the lower 48, mm -hmm. We're taught that fish that's gone bad, you shouldn't eat it. So I just have to keep telling myself I'm not eating spoiled fish. Mm -hmm. No traditional meal in Alaska would be complete without a guttuck. This will be the second time I've had the mixture of fat, sugar, fish, and berries. After my last experience with this stuff, I'm fairly hesitant, but I'll give it another shot. Holy cow. This is really amazing, though. Mm -hmm. If you didn't tell somebody what that is, they would just think this is blueberry sorbet. This mm -hmm. is incredible. Mm -hmm. See, you really got to come where they know how to make this stuff. Because I've had this in some other parts of Alaska, and they don't have half the agoutuck skills that you guys do. What a fabulous day. You got oh, hey, you know something? I'm going to give... Okay. I almost forgot to give Lucy her hostess gift, the fresh whitefish we got earlier in the day. Nice! You can salt them and ferment them oh. and let them rot. And then when I come back next year, we can eat these fish after you pull them out of the ground. I'm not waiting that long. <laughs> nice! Thank you very much. My pleasure.